Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the second of our presentations about training for the Marmot. The Marmot is, of course, the oldest, the toughest, and quite simply the best of the French sportives or Grand Fondos. My name is Marvin, I'm Marvin Four, and I'm the founder and general manager of Alpine Coles, and we're a group of cycling coaches based in the Alps. I made our first presentation on part one of the training plan on the 24th of November, and it's now available on YouTube in the Alpine Coles channel. Um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend you do because um, I'm not going to, I said a lot of stuff there that I'm, I'm only going to summarize this time. I'm not going to repeat it. Today, of course, I'm presenting part two uh, of the training plan. And then on the 8th of June, I'll present hints, tips, strategy, and tactics for how to get your best result on the day itself. If you've got any questions uh, uh, later, don't hesitate to send them to me at info at alpinecalls.com and I'll do my best to reply quickly. Before we get into part two, allow me to make a very quick commercial. We're running two coaching camps before the Marmot, either of which would be ideal to do a big block in the mountains while at the same time getting plenty of feedback and coaching advice from me and, and my team. So the first is, a, is a, at the end of May, uh, based in La Clusa and Morzin, and that will might be of interest to some of you. That will also include a, a recce of the route of the Etape du Tour. And then from the 10th to the 17th of June, we'll actually be in El Pedrez, um, and of course, um, we'll be riding the, not the entire route of the Marmot, but we're riding certainly some of the, the climbs. The quote at the bottom from James is very typical of quotes we get. Uh, from our clients, and you can read plenty more of them on our website. We've been coaching people for events like the Marmot, the Etape du Tour, and the Haute Route for 10 years now. Uh, so if you want to give yourself the best chance of doing well, just go to our website and sign up for one of these camps, and we'd love to see you. End of the commercial break. So into the meat of it. What does it take to do well at the Marmot? It makes little sense to talk about training for the Marmot until we're clear on what it takes to do well, in fact. For those of you who've already seen part one, this is a reminder, uh, so I'll go through it quickly. If you haven't seen part one, again, I do recommend listening to it. The most important physical characteristics for the marmot are, one, a high power to weight ratio for the climbs, two, excellent aerobic endurance. Uh, you'll take, if you're one of the, 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 the leaders, you'll take six and a half hours. If you're one of the slowest, you'll take 13 or 14 hours total. That's a long time to be on a bike. Uh, with multiple long times, so you need outstanding aerobic endurance. In addition, you need mental strength. You need the ability to climb and descend well. Uh, you need to be able to pace yourself um, so you don't uh, burn everything on the first climb. And last but not least, you need the ability to eat and drink enough to fuel your ride. So your training plan should address all of these points. This is the, the first and most important principle if you want to do well at the Marmot, you need to make it a priority. Not only in your training, but also to some extent uh, in your life. Next, you need to be consistent. You should be doing some sort of training on at least uh, four and better five days per week. Three, uh, the most important quality you need to develop is your aerobic base which means a lot of time spent on your bike, mostly at low intensity. Fourth principle is to develop your fat burning capacity, which I explain in detail in part one. Now, the fifth principle is to build short-term muscular endurance and, and durability. Sixth is to increase the load progressively to give your body time to adapt. Number seven, never lose sight of the fact that your body only gets stronger when you're resting and recovering. Training creates the stimulus needed. So obviously, you've got to train, but it breaks you down. It breaks the muscles down, and you only get stronger during recovery. So there must be enough time built in to recover. And finally, uh, number eight, monitor your readiness for high load. This is important because research over the last few years has shown that training hard only has a positive effect if your body's in a state to benefit from it. So we'll look at that in more detail in a few minutes. 
Our proposed training plan has three phases, preparation or the base phase, which finishes at the end of this month. So that's basically over. Then the pre-competition phase running from April to mid-June. And finally, the competition or taper phase for the last one or two weeks. So today I'm focusing on the pre-competition phase between essentially now, beginning of April and the uh, middle of June. Here you can see our framework training plan, which some of you may be, may be following already. If you haven't seen it, you can download it from the Marmot website uh, where it's under practical infos and then Alpine Cole's uh, uh, documents, or just send me an email to request it. As I've said before, it's a framework and it's not a detailed day-by-day -day training plan. The idea is that you should take the framework and design your own training plan that will be perfectly tailored for you. And my goal is to give you all the elements you need to, to design a sensible training plan, but then taking into account your uh, particular constraints and your particular level. The second page of the plan provides you with a typical training week and suggested workouts during each period. Just a reminder that the harder you intend to race, the more you need to do in terms of intervals and high intensity, but it should never be more than two sessions per week. The Marmot is a very long event, and so it, it's the aerobic base which is by far the most important. If you're less experienced and your objective is simply to finish, then really you should focus essentially on building your aerobic capacity through volume, meaning lots of kilometers and lots of climbing. So the objectives, let's look at what should be in this, in this part of your training plan from now to mid-June. The key objectives are uh, one, uh, again, to strengthen your aerobic endurance so that you can ride seven to eight hours without undue fatigue in training. Two um, is to work on your durability, which is the ability to repeat the key climbs, the long climbs without losing power. Ideally, you want to be able to do uh, all of the climbs, starting with the Glandon and going on to the Telegraph, the Galibier, uh, and then the, um, the climb to Alpeduez, you want to do them all at the same pace, if you can. For nearly everybody, pace drops off on Alpeduez, and that means you're lacking durability. The third uh, key objective is to optimize your nutrition so that you're fueling your training adequately, you're facilitating fat oxidation, and finally you're training your gut for the large amount of carbs you need to eat during the marmot. Fourth, it's important to simulate race conditions, not right now, but uh, uh, certainly towards the end of May and in June. Do that two or three times before the event. And then finally, include some exercises to sharpen your, both your mental skills and certain technical skills, such as descending and cornering at speed. So these are the objectives. Now let's look at how to do it. First, it's important to make sure your training zones are accurate. I'm showing here a simplified three zone model because that's really all you need. And this model shows clearly the two physiological markers that we call we all call thresholds. So those are, of course, LT1 and then critical power or FTP. So remember that these so-called thresholds are in fact a range and they're certainly not constant, but they vary with your level of fitness, but also with your short term fatigue. If we tested your FTP at the end of the MAMA, it would be a long way below what it was at the start. So how do we determine the two, uh, the two key thresholds? The first threshold, LT1, the best way to do it is through a lactate test. That means either going to a lab or purchasing your own uh, lactate tester. So most people, of course, don't do that. Um, failing that, you can use the torque test or the breathing test. What's the torque test? It means that when you're riding along at what you what you hope is the right pace, you should be able to talk easily uh, to a companion in complete sentences. If you can't do that, then you're going too fast. If you're having to uh, to to breathe in the middle of a sentence or gasp your way through, you're definitely going too fast. So the torque test is a good one. It should be easy conversation. The other one you can do on a turbo trainer is, is a breathing test. You do a, a, a ramp test where you ramp up the, 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 the intensity slowly and you, you pay very careful attention to your breathing. 
And the point where your breathing starts to intensify, where you can no longer breathe through your nose, for example, is is um, very is going to be very close to LT1. It's a good indicator of LT1. So that's for the the lower threshold. It's usually lower than you think. It's certainly lower than you hope for nearly everybody, because uh, the higher it is, the better. The second threshold, so you can you can determine it uh, either using critical power or using FTP. For critical power, uh, it's it's a little bit easier. Uh, you do uh, three maximum efforts at um, durations like they don't have to be these exactly, but somewhere around two minutes, somewhere around six minutes, and somewhere around fifteen minutes. And then you use a software package or an online calculator uh, to come up with your critical power. The other uh, way to do it is FTP. Critical power and FTP are very, very close. So, you know, they're, they're within a few watts of each other. They're just determined in different ways, but it's, it's getting at the same thing. So to do FTP, um, the easy way or the easier way is to do one out, uh, all out maximum effort of 20 minutes. But it's better to do an all, uh, maximum effort of 45 to 60 minutes. You'll get a, a more accurate answer that way. Your FTP is going to be somewhere between 93 or 97 percent of your 20 minute power or uh, more likely about 100 percent of your 45 to 60 minute power. So these are these are estimates, which is one reason why I say it's it, it's only a range anyway, but it, it gives you a, 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 you know, a reasonable estimate. So that's important to have these uh, correct so that you know what your training zones are. Particular, the most important one being the lower one, LT1. So once you know that your training zones are accurate, it's important to realize you should only do hard sessions when your body is ready for them. I talked quite a bit about this last time. Uh, if you do a hard session when your body is not ready for it, it, it is almost literally a waste of time. Uh, so how can you tell? There's no single measure that captures everything going on. Current best practice is to look at three separate measures of uh, of resinous um, that uh, that look at three different aspects of it, in fact. So the first is perceived fatigue and muscle soreness. And this gives you an indication of the progress in, in, your, in your muscle tissue repair. So if you've done a hard workout, you will have damaged your muscles and you, your muscles will feel sore. Uh, so the repair going on is an, is, uh, uh, you know, the fact they're being repaired is an, is an indication. Uh, the fact they feel sore is an indication that repair is taking place. The second measure is heart rate variability, which gives insights into the state of your autonomic nervous system. And it's an insight, in fact, into the level of stress you're under. And that's a combination of, of all stress you're under. So it's training stress for sure. But also if you're under stress at work or at home or life in general, then that will also come out in, in the HRV uh, measure. And the third one is um, a submaximal fatigue test, SFT. Uh, and that provides an indication of your accumulated fatigue and in particular your ability to take on load linked to to what extent the glycogen is depleted in, in your muscles. And we don't have time here to go into the technicalities of HRV and the submaximal fatigue test. If you're interested, I refer you to my YouTube uh, video on the subject, which, uh, which explains all that in detail. What you can do very easily is to use the subjective measures that I mentioned for perceived fatigue and muscle soreness. So you can use the scales like these ones here, which are very good. They're from training peaks. And all you do is you note your feeling on both scales soon after you get up in the morning and you use them to adapt your training plan. So red flags for doing hard sessions would be a combination of, of fatigue at level five and above and muscle soreness at level eight and above. If in doubt, be cautious. Uh, don't fall in the no pain, no gain trap uh, because that can uh, lead you astray, particularly in this type of training for a, a long endurance event. So to summarize on this point, you should monitor and adjust your training load using, using uh, subjective feelings, perhaps with uh, quantified by um, 
uh, HRV and and a weekly uh, submaximal fatigue test if you if you if you want to do that. I mean, I recommend doing it, but it's not necessary for everybody. Don't get macho and ignore these indicators. So back off when you need to, and then rethink the plan. Normally, it's enough to replace a planned hard session, either by an easy one or by complete rest, and then reschedule the hard session for a day or two later. Right? So you can still do uh, easy sessions, just avoid the really hard ones or the very long ones and reschedule them for a day or two later. Now, let's talk about how to strengthen your aerobic endurance. The basic thing is to do as many long rides as possible below the first threshold, below LT1. The key metric here is time and not distance. Now, the reason I say that is because if your goal is distance, you'll be tempted to ride fast for faster to finish early, which is contrary to what you're trying to achieve here. The point of the long rides is to develop your aerobic endurance and your fat burning capacity and this is optimum at a level of intensity below LT1. So if you push yourself into riding faster than LT1, it's suboptimum. It's, it's just it's not as effective in training terms. And on top of that, it will create more fatigue, which means that your next training session will be less effective. So set yourself a target of time to ride, not distance, and make sure you stay below that first threshold. For most people, this is less than 60% or so of your critical power, your FTP. Now the problem is, for some people, that they can that um, you know you can find it boring. So let's look at a few ways to counter that. I've got I've got a whole bunch of ideas that uh, you can think about to counter the the possible boredom. But the first one is uh, pretty obvious, which is to ride with a partner. Uh, the the challenge here, of course, is to find a partner who has a similar level and shares the same goal for the ride. If you if you've got a partner who likes to push hard, that's that's no good for, for this. Now, so you need to find someone who's willing to ride at your pace with you. Next idea is to make it a game. Um, and one good game is to, is to try to ride from start to finish at, at exactly the same steady intensity uh, throughout. Uh, that's easy enough in a flat area. It gets more and more difficult in uh, if there are if there are um, valleys and uh, hills to climb and in the mountains it becomes really quite difficult in fact it's, it's, it's impossible by moments uh, because on the descents you obviously can't put if you're already going very fast you're not going to put more uh, uh, more power on and then you have to get around the corner so it, there are times when you can't do it but uh, the more you can do it the better Next idea is to improve your pedaling skills. Long, slow rides are a great opportunity to focus on smooth pedaling. Uh, so uh, and not only, not just pushing down, but also unweighting. So it's a not necessarily pulling up, but at least unweighting to bring your leg up, pushing it over the top, and then scraping it back on the bottom to make that whole cir uh, circling motion as smooth as possible. Another idea is to do one leg drills, which is a pedal with just one leg at a time. Uh, unclip and just pedal with one leg for 30 seconds or a minute. Uh, and if you've never done this, I can tell you it's guaranteed to increase your respect for amputee cyclists. It's incredibly hard, but it uh, it's a good draw. Uh, you can play all sorts of cadence games. Uh, so on one particular ride, you might want to just simply increase your average cadence. So just pedal, pedal, pedal at a higher cadence for the whole ride. Don't overdo that because um, the higher your cadence, the higher your heart rate. And so that can push you into a higher zone. So, so, so just pay a, be a bit careful uh, on overdoing that. Another thing you can do, uh, whoops, uh, I'll just stay on cadence for a moment. Another thing you can do is um, spin outs. So these are very short exercises where you put yourself in a very easy gear uh, the goal is not at all to to put any power on the on 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 the pedals. It's to spin as fast as you possibly can. So aim at uh, reaching 150 rpm, and with practice, you should be able to get to 170 or or even 180. But it takes practice. You're having to teach your muscles to fire. Uh, you're using all sorts of different muscles in the pedal stroke, and they've got to the different muscles have to fire in exactly the right order. 
And of course, at 180 RPM, that's three times a second. Um, so it's very, it's, it's very, very rapid. Uh, it's, but it's an excellent uh, exercise. And the other thing, of course, you can do is just vary the cadence throughout the ride. You do perhaps do the climbs at very low cadence or relatively low cadence, and then and then use a high cadence on the flat or on a descent. Obviously, you can enjoy the scenery. The, the picture there is um, not very far from Mont Ventoux, uh, although you wouldn't uh, necessarily notice that, uh, see that from the <laughs> from the flowers and the and the trees. Um, uh, but uh, there's lots of lovely scenery to cycle through, so so enjoy it, and that uh, reduces the the boredom as you go along. I've got a whole load more ideas for you here. Uh, you can work on your breathing. You can improve your, your 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 breathing skills. Consciously slow it down and breathe more deeply and and with your belly. You can ride in the drops to strengthen your upper body position and your um, your your um, abdominals. You can work on your bike handling skills. So a simple thing to do is to drink and eat with your other hand. In other words, the one you don't normally use to drink and eat. Um, another thing you can do is, uh, is keep pedaling constantly. So don't stop pedaling when you're drinking. So take the, bot take the bottle, drink and put it back while you're pedaling all the time. Um, you can uh, learn to ride hands free. If you, if you don't have that skill already, it's definitely a good one to develop. Takes a bit of practice, but anyone can anyone can do it. Then while riding hands-free, swap things around in your pockets is a good exercise. Then uh, practice taking off your gloves and putting them back on. And then progress to taking off your jacket and putting it back or your gilet, your gilet, you know, your sleeveless jacket or your jacket uh, and putting it back on. That's a really good skill to have on a on a ride in the mountains. Um, because you definitely need a jacket for, or most of the time anyway, you need a jacket for the descent. And if you have to stop and put it on, that uh, costs you a couple of minutes. On a suitable circuit, you can practice taking corners faster and faster, braking later or not at all, and carrying your speed through the corner. So there's all sorts of bike handling skills you can practice. Our next one is you can practice uh, what the French call dancing on the pedals, so standing up on the pedals when you're when you're climbing. You can uh, uh, practice your descending, of course, if there's a if there's a, some hills near you. Uh, you can explore new roads, and um, join a slow club ride to ride with less experienced riders who are going to be more at uh, the pace you want to be at. So a bunch of ideas for um, doing these long slow rides without getting bored. All of these will help you with the golden rule, which is to train properly. And what does that mean? Well, it means stick to your training plan and ignore other cyclists. So don't get sucked into jumping on someone's wheel if they if they go past you faster. Uh, it's very tempting, I know, but um, better not. And the time for being competitive is not during your training rides, but it's during the actual competition. So train uh, train right. Uh, in order to be able to ride very hard and compete very well in the competition. Now, coming to the second point, you need to develop your durability. Durability, what is it? It's the ability to make repeated efforts at medium to high intensity. The better your durability, the more likely you are to be able to make a decent effort up Alpaduez at the end of the mama. There are two ways to work on it. Uh, the first is to do sweet spot or sub-threshold interval sessions. You might want to do, for example, four by 10 minute intervals in April, progress to three by 15 minute intervals in May, and finally do two by 20 or even three by 20 in June. You should do at least one interval session per week, but no more than two. Okay, if you do more than two, you're going to be, you're working too hard at the upper end and you'll be too tired to do, uh, to train properly during the long uh, aerobic um, rides. The second way to work on durability, and you can start doing this probably mid-May onwards, is to increase the intensity near the end of a long ride when your legs are already tired. Uh, so the photo there is uh, on the second climb up Mont Ventoux, so that's um, getting towards the end of a long ride. And of course, uh, that's a great climb to push a little bit harder towards the end if you've got the, the legs for it. Third point then is about optimizing your nutrition. Let's come to that now. This is a very important part of your training. Uh, I'm not going to repeat everything I said uh, in the part one video. So this is mainly a reminder. The first point 
is to make sure that you're eating enough to fuel your training. The second is to continue to develop your fat burning ability. And then the third is to train your gut to absorb enough carbohydrate during the race. So how do we actually do this? First, about fueling your training. It's this, uh, this really is, here is just a reminder. It's important to eat a wide variety of the highest quality non-processed foods and to adjust the amount you eat to your energy expenditure. On a long ride, you might easily expend three or 4,000 calories and you need to replace that. And so don't be tempted to take it as an opportunity to lose weight uh, and, and eat normally or, or, or even less than normal. That you might, you would indeed lose weight, but you won't gain the benefit of the training and you'll not be in good condition to train again the next day. So if you, if losing weight is important for you, you need to do it very, very progressively and to just create a very low, a very small calorie deficit. So you're not losing more than one or 200 grams a week. You know, a, a kilogram a month is really the maximum you should try to lose when you're training hard. Otherwise, you're just going to compromise your training. Now, looking at fat burning, to, to maintain your ability to burn fat, which hopefully you've developed over the last three months, make sure you start your long rides at low intensity. If you start even at moderate tempo intensity, you kickstart your body into burning carbs rather than fat. Okay, so particularly if you start the long ride without uh, breakfast, so in a fasted state, stay on the safe side and don't go above 50% of your critical power or FTP for the first couple of hours. And then no food for the first two to three hours. And then from after three hours, ramp up to 60 grams or so of carbohydrates per hour. So that's on the long, easy rides. Now, training your gut, this is a totally different approach. And it's a different approach on your tempo or race pace ride. So you're not going to do this on a, on, on a low intensity ride. Uh, so on a tempo or a race pace ride or any ride with intervals, you need to be properly fueled anyway. So you can take the opportunity to train your gut to tolerate the high amounts of carbo carbohydrate you'll need at the moment. If, you like, if you're like most people, you probably rarely take more than 60 grams an hour, which is the equivalent of two bananas or two gels or two energy bars or any combination of those per hour. And so a lot of people, you know, many people find that already quite a lot to eat uh, continually hour after hour on a ride. But there's a clear advantage in being able to use up to at least 90 grams and even 120 grams per hour during, during an event like the marmot. The problem is it takes practice and your stomach will tell you if you've gone too far. Now you, you want to progressively increase, uh, well, first up to 90 and then see if you can get it any further. Do that by experimenting with different foods and different gels to see which works for you. And don't forget, you can also drink your carbs. Um, a bottle of energy drink can include th uh, 30 grams, up to 30 grams or even slightly more, depending on the concentration. Problem when it's too concentrated is it just tastes too sweet and too sticky. And so it gets difficult, particularly if it's hot, that becomes very difficult to, to take on. Well, the fourth uh, part is about simulating race conditions. So this is uh, two or three times during the last six to eight weeks. Uh, you should find an opportunity to do this. Don't do it every weekend because it's just too hard and, and it'll be detrimental to your training. So one opportunity is to join a hard club ride, uh, the sort of club ride where everybody's really pushing it for three or four hours. Those rides are, are a lot of fun. But again, they're, they're too hard to do every weekend if you're training seriously for, for the marble. The other, of course, is to sign up for another event where the result doesn't really matter and you can just use it to test and experiment. The fifth point was, uh, is about sharpening your mental and technical skills. And this is the, the final uh, area we're gonna talk about. First, the mental side, or what's uh, co usually called psychological preparation, which is really important for an event like the Mama where mental strength can make a big difference and it can, can even make the difference between finishing or not finishing. 
there will almost certainly be times on the mama when you wonder why you're doing it and you have to fight a strong desire to stop. Uh, for some people, this happens on the Galibier. Uh, for many others, it happens on the final climb to, to Alpa for, 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 for me, it's happened, uh, it, it usually happens to me already on the Galibier. And then I get to Alpa Duez and I think, good Lord, you know, why, why am I doing this again? So there are three main mental approaches that can help you to keep turning the pedals. All of which, the reason I'm talking about them now is because all of them you should practice actively during your training. So the first is to have a clear reason why you're doing it. The second is to find ways to reduce your perception of effort, because the easier it, it seems to you, then the harder you can go. And the third way is to use positive self-talk. Okay, so we'll look at each of those in turn. But why are you doing this? If there's no good reason to push on to the finish, why would you bother? And especially when you arrive at Bourg-Doison, and if your hotel is in the valley, you need a lot of motivation to go up to the finish. So the reasons must be meaningful, and they must be yours. You know, my reasons are not going to help you. They might be internal, personal reasons, such as your own enjoyment and satisfaction, uh, your satisfaction of collecting the finisher's medal, uh, you can see around my, my wife's neck here, or they might be external reasons, uh, such as, for example, to raise money for charity or to please or, or to impress other people or, or, or any other external reason. So both internal and external motivations are perfectly valid and they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, so it, it really doesn't matter. It's the, the key point is you should think this through and be clear about it in advance, you know, why you are doing this. So when things get tough, you can remind yourself of that. Second mental skill is, is, is about reducing your perception of effort. The harder it feels, the more you'll want to stop. So any technique that can make it feel less hard can help you keep going. Such techniques include a distraction, which is thinking about something else uh, or imagining yourself uh, in another place or reciting a poem or, or, or singing a song to yourself or repeating a mantra um, or, or, or anything that helps to distract you from, uh, from the, the, the feeling of effort. The second possibility is to focus very intently. It's almost, it's almost the opposite. It's kind of embracing the present Focus very intently on, on, on something like the rear wheel hub of the rider in front of you, or your breathing, uh, or your pedal stroke, uh, or, or indeed the scenery around you. And then third, and I love this one, and it's not a joke, is, is simply to smile. And if you don't feel like smiling, you just force your mouth into a, into the, into a smile. Uh, and that will actually reduce, your research has shown that actually releases endorphins which are the body's natural painkillers. And therefore that automatically makes the effort feel a little bit less. And the other great thing I love about smiling is that it spooks all the riders around you. So, so, so go for it. The third mental skill is to use positive self-talk. And there's been uh, research done on cyclists actually, which shows that it may be more effective to use the second person. Uh, so try saying things like, to yourself, of course, like you are strong, I'm proud of you. You're, you're doing great. You're living the dream. This is what you've been training for. Now you're, now you're here, you're doing it. Whatever you choose to say, it will be more powerful if you've used it already in training. So think about it, write down what, uh, what you think might work for you and practice. So this was a very brief overview of a complicated topic, the psychological preparation. You can find more on the Marmot website on the practical info and the Alpine Coles training program. Uh, there's a document on mental preparation that I've uh, written and put there. So, so I recommend looking at that if you, if you haven't done already. Finally, last but not least, you should be practicing and improving your technical skills during your training, such as uh, climbing, of course, uh, descending, riding in a bunch and changing clothing while you're riding for example taking off a jacket and putting it back on of course if you join one of our training camps we'll work closely with you to help you improve uh, these skills and, and and many more 
So that's it. I've given you what you need, uh, hopefully, to prepare yourself well over these final three months. So rendezvous on the 8th of June to talk about how to get your best result on the day. And in the meantime, it's up to you to train hard and go for it. Um, if you'd like professional help to be absolutely your best on the day, do sign up for one of our two training camps at the end of May or, or in mid-June. And uh, you can also join one of the many people who are benefiting from one-on-one -on -one coaching by Alpine Colt. Just drop me an email for that and uh, we can talk about it. Thank you very much for listening. Good luck with your training. See you on the start line uh, on June the 25th. And I'm now open to any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you, Marvin, for this interesting presentation. I, I do have a question. Um, I tend to have uh, often cramp, and I know you have to drink and you need to take magnesium. Do you have other tips to, uh, to prevent that from happening? Uh, other tips, then, yeah, you can, as you say, magnesium can help. Um, but uh, the, the cr cramps during a, a ride like the Marmot are, uh, are called exercise-induced cramps. And they come about because you've pushed harder than, you, than you're than you used to for longer than you're used to. So um, it, it probably happens to all of us. I mean, it certainly happened to me uh, on, on several occasions. Really, the, the best tip I can give is as you, if you feel cramps starting, you normally you feel, feel a little twitch and you feel it might be coming on. The best thing you can do at that point is just to back off, take the easiest gear possible and spin. You know, that, that's, that's really the best solution, the best uh, advice I can give. That, that's always worked for me. You know, sometimes I have to back off for much longer than I really want to. <laughs> well, people are riding past. It's annoying. But, you know, if you're getting cramps, you, you, you have to do it. There's just no choice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marvin, hello there. Um, some oh. of us probably haven't been able, I certainly haven't been able to follow um, that first uh first period of training due to uh some rehabilitation issues if we're a little bit behind where we should be do we just sort of take that on board and just do the endurance piece and and just keep pushing the endurance and 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 scale back our intentions on the day that's it, it, it depends a little bit on how, how strong you are as a cyclist, how long you've been off the bike and, and, and that type of thing. But I would say in general, you're probably best off focusing on the aerobic endurance and lots of long, slow rides and a little bit less on the, um, on, on the higher intensity. You're certainly no more than one, one per week, perhaps, perhaps one every 10 days or two weeks rather than the one to two a week. I would recommend if you're <clears throat> if you're feeling good and feeling fit and feeling strong. But then, but, but really to uh, to to maximise that sort of that that low zone yeah. sort of endurance and and time in the saddle. Yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 a sad fact, but the the um, the endurance gains take much longer than the top end gains. You know, you can you can pretty easily improve your. Um, vo2 max in, you can improve that in two or three weeks of, of hard intervals um but it goes away just as quickly yeah the endurance gains take much longer to build um but they're also uh, the, you know the the other side of that is you, the, you keep them for much longer too sure and 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 if if that endurance is taking a little while should i consider changing my chain set from a from a compact to a say a grx chain set just to make it a little bit easier on the climbs yeah yeah sure sure i have, I have no hesitation in recommending um, um 34 tooth on the rear cassette or even a 36 it depends obviously which group set you've got but um i think the sram ones will take a 36 now um I, I, you know it's it's amazing what you can put on so there's, there should be no shame in putting an easy um it, you know, a, a, between inverted commas easy cassette on the back absolutely Sure. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Marvin. Thanks again for the for second session. I do have a question. 
I'm actually aiming um, on getting the gold medal. I'm 34 years of age. But what kind of what per kilogram goal should I be working on? Do you have like any thoughts on that? Uh, to, to get to get a gold medal. Uh, at the moment. Yeah. A gold certificate. Um I, I, well I've 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 had one uh, several I think every time I've written I've received a gold um and my watts per kilo are not not that impressive. Um I think I was probably at around 3.8 to 4. Um, so it might be possible down to 3.6 or, or thereabouts, uh, I am. Uh, I, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what when the cutoff is. Okay, I uh, think you're I, right. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, your watts per kilo is going to be a result of your training anyway. It's not really something you can you can target so 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 easily for, for the marmot. It's it's really an endurance event, so you shouldn't be working too much at the higher end. Uh, I'm actually working on a polarized schedule, so I, I I have that, of course, working on that FTP, and then I, I was kind of imagining like what kind of what what would be good, considering the fact that I also do like long endurance rides. I'm already working on like four to five hours in endurance rides, so it was like if I get the, if if that would be like for goal. If uh, what would it be to even go sub seven hours or something, you know, like to have an, have something in mind as as like a goal to work for in these coming three months? Um, I, I'm only guessing now, but my, I think for uh, to be sub seven hours, you'd probably you'd need to be over four watts per kilo. Probably four point two, four point three would be my guess. All right. Okay. That's good then. Then it really means that I need to work more on my endurance. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, serious. No, I, I just wanted to say thank you, Marvin, for oh. this second presentation. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you to all for joining. It's been a pleasure. Good luck with your training. Bye now.